it's a massive like personal pleasure for me to to sit here with Eric. Uh, I uh, you know in undergrad actually I was uh, working at the Whitehead Institute, which we'll kind of get into. Uh, that Eric was you know pretty seminal in getting off the ground, uh, working on uh, you know biological sciences and genetics and cancer research, etc. And so for those of you who don't know, Eric is a trained mathematician originally. I think he even spent some time in the UK. Yep. Um, Did my DPhil here. DPhil in Oxford. And, uh, and then went on into biology, uh, became a professor of systems biology and biology at Harvard and MIT, uh, was really involved in forming the Whitehead Institute, which was one of the main places for the Human uh, Genome Project. And then founded the Broad, which uh, if some of you came a few years ago, we'll have seen a few speakers from. Um, is also involved in science policy and, and other really impactful projects. So we're kind of going to take these like 30 minutes to jump into some of these juicy topics. Um, and perhaps to, to kick off, one of the things I was interested in your kind of career path is uh, you've gone across a bunch of different disciplines. And we have people here from lots of different disciplines. And you know, when I speak with founders who are interested in you know, machine learning and then kind of interested in getting into energy or biology, sometimes they're intimidated with crossing the chasm into a new field. And so I don't know, I'm just like personally interested to understand like how did you kind of cross from you know, math into biology and make all these like amazing uh, kind of impacts in fields that you, know, you originally knew nothing about? Well, I mean, it is intimidating. Um, and so you don't do it unless you kind of feel like you have to do it, meaning you're so excited about it mm. <clears throat> that you're willing to pick up a new language and a new culture and things like that. I think, um, you know, biology has a history of physicists coming in and deciding that the problem with biology is that biologists aren't smart, yep. they're physicists, therefore they're smart, yep. and, and they can solve things that way. And the, the, the bug is they don't learn the culture of biology. What is a good question? What's a good experiment? Yep. If you're willing to take the time to, to recognize that different fields have different cultures, that sometimes they're set by a deep understanding of what matters in the field or what's possible in the field or mm. what the, the, the errors are in the field, then it's, it's not mm. that hard. Um, but it takes having some friends who are willing to really teach you, yeah. teach you because it is a, it's a cultural thing that you pick up. And your brother's in biology, right? My brother's in biology, and indeed, it was my brother that, that played some role in this yeah. because I was writing my thesis on coding theory, and I, I like mathematics, but I didn't want to be a pure mathematician as a career because it's pretty monastic, and I didn't feel like I was a good monk. And so um, he was the one who actually said, oh, you should l learn about the brain because the brain has lots of coding in it and all that, and being hopelessly naive as one is in one's 20s, yeah. I said, oh, that sounds interesting. Why not? <laughs> And then uh, I think we should discuss this uh, human genome project, which uh, I mean is probably one of the biggest slash boldest scientific projects like ever. Uh, I think it's it represented a change in the way biologists approach yeah. approach things that was really pretty seminal, because um, before that point, most of the biology you did was in your lab notebook. Yeah. It was not data out in the world. And that was, that was because there was a view that the important things to learn in biology would be learned you know, down the barrel of your microscope. I don't mean that literally, because not everybody was working down their microscope, yeah. but by focusing very hard on single things. So when the idea of the Human Genome Project got floated, 85, 86, the biology editor of Nature Someone I like dearly, Miranda Robertson, wrote a news and views in the front of Nature, yeah. which said, well, look, we, we, we had this meeting at Cold Spring Harbor where this was discussed. And she said, if we're still struggling to figure out what the two human disease genes that had been cloned based on their mapping did, there was Duchenne muscular dystrophy and chronic granulomatous disease, uh, chronic granulomatous disease, if we're still struggling to understand them, what possible use could come from more data? Now, we, mm. we can't, in an audience like this, imagine saying such a thing. But this was the leading biology editor at the leading journal in the world. And it indicated that there was not a sense that there would be things that would be learned at the ground level 
and things that would be learned at this level, and things that would be learned at 37,000 feet. Yeah. And I think what the Human Genome Project told us was biology has elements that are finite. There's a periodic table. It's not the 100 or so elements. It's, it's the number of genes and the number of nucleotides. But it was, it was a kind of enclosure act that biology had a finite amount of data. And if you could get that genetic data, you would approach every problem differently because you would know that the answer was somewhere on the table yeah. rather than out there in the dark. Yeah. That's continued to, to ripple over biology, but that was a huge paradigm shift. Yeah, and for, for me what I found interesting when I was at the Whitehead and then going to some of your lectures at the Broad was, and I remember there was, I think, a news and views between uh, Bob Weinberg who's arguing for hypothesis-driven research, like you have to understand kind of how a system works, knock out a gene and see what happens. And then uh, I think it was Todd Golub who was at the Broad at the time who said, I'm probably bastardizing it, but basically take the data-driven approach and let the data tell you the, yep, tell the answer, yep. or tell you the hypothesis. Um, so I think it'd be interesting to dig into that because that was well, kind of, of heresy back then, right? Well, you know, Bob is, a, Bob is, for those of you who don't know him, a brilliant cancer biologist. Yeah, he wrote the textbook, and I mean wrote the really. textbook. It is really the beautiful textbook of cancer biology. And um, he is so much the the do the individual experiment, analyze it carefully, and I'm probably the extreme opposite, and for 15 years we taught MIT's intro bio course together. Which is on YouTube, I think. Which is, which is on YouTube, uh, uh, as, you know, so we have very different points of view, yeah. but it's really fun to talk with Bob and get along, and I have total respect for what Bob is, you know, is doing, and total respect for what this data-driven point of view is doing. And I think the important thing is to recognize mm. there will always be big new perspectives and fields. Mm. And if you want to stay relevant, you should always be open to that possibility. Yeah, yeah. But um, at least in the entrepreneurial uh, like space with pharmaceuticals, drug discovery, I think we discussed some of these topics today of you know using machine learning to sort of ask questions of the genome and figure out, I don't know, what might be a drug target. It's very different from traditional biotechnology company building, which would probably um, you know, follow the church of, of Bob a bit more. Um, and it seems like we need, as you said, like discussion between both fields. But at the moment, uh, given like where the world is at and public markets and stuff, there's a bit on the biotech f side that I feel, which is like pointing to the tech people saying like, hey, I told you like software wasn't going to solve the problem uh -huh. for discovery. And then like us on the, on the tech side talking to biologists saying, yeah, but if our machine learning approach works, then we can have a much more systematic way to to discover drugs and have a more repeatable engine. So I don't know, I'd be interested in maybe some of your comments if, if you have any around um, this kind of, like uniting both churches as it were. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's tricky. Well, it's tricky because I have a lot of respect for, for both of those. And I think the key thing to say is, like there's not the problem of drug discovery. Yeah. There's the problems of drug discovery. Um, making a molecule that binds to something really well is very important. And if you can compress the time to do that, that's great. It still is only a fraction of the time of the whole thing, like a small fraction. Mm. But it doesn't make it unimportant. If you can tell me that that molecule is less likely to cause side effects, as some of the yep. AI models are going to tell us, that's great. You'll increase a probability of success. Yep. You'd be foolish not to use it, but on the other hand, it doesn't get you all the way there. The big money is spent in a clinical trial. Yep. Can we figure out how to make clinical trials more efficient? That is by maximally predicting who are the best people to, to try this drug in and answer a question and get it. So I think these arguments sometimes, I, I don't know, get a little oversimplified on yeah. Wall Street, maybe. Yeah. Um, and you're trying to solve at least a let's say, significant rate-limiting steps. Yeah. And I think AI can have a big effect in some of those. Yeah. And some of them are going to come down to you know, other things that, that are in medicine. Yeah. So I, I'm actually pretty ecumenical in my, yeah. my view of this. Good. Um, then it'd be maybe interesting to dive into some of your experience like at the Whitehead and the Broad, particularly as these organizations are um, also cross-disciplinary, embarked on yeah, very ambitious, bold science. Um, so maybe some comments around like you know how you assemble those kinds of teams and set the mission and you know and also like there was some tension between the, the publicly funded projects and their private corporations and to some degree we have a 
some analogies right now with you know closed tech and open source tech and. Um, okay, well those are that's small questions. Yeah, so let's see um, where to start on that. Um, let's talk about assembling teams, and then remind me if I get lost that you also want to ask Great. this question of of, uh, of public and private and all that. So assembling teams. <clears throat> In academia, we tend to be very vertical. Um, you know, you're an expert on chemistry, and, and well, I mean, not just chemistry, it's got to be on organic chemistry. Yep. And then, you know, um, we don't have as many structures that reward either inter interdisciplinary work or teamwork. Mm. Uh, academics are rewarded because uh, they're the first author or the last author on some set of papers, and they have, you know, citations. And people, you know, optimize toward toward those sorts of incentives. You know, industry does a fine job of incenting teams with yeah. vehicles like a stock, yeah. where you have a common purpose, but it only incents work on something where you can appropriate the value of the thing you've created. Mm -hmm. um, you can't create basic knowledge that way because you don't own it at the end. So there's kind of this tension between academia, very good for basic knowledge that will transform the world, but not so good for organizing teams. Industry, good for organizing teams, but not so good for organizing the basic knowledge. I think academia and industry have to move to create other environments in which people are incented to mm. work together in teams. And I think the Broad has been an example of that, mm. where <clears throat> young people come to the Broad not to be some ant in an army doing something, but because they think it's gonna be an incredible jumping off point for their careers, right. but because of that, they're willing to give of themselves toward common effort because they will gain from it. Mm. There's an enlightened self-interest from saying, if I spend half my time on this team and because of that I can be 10 times more effective on the things that I personally am doing, mm. it's a win-win. The broad works because we do that. That takes a certain clarity of vision of what are the big problems that are going on, right. the recognition that we should not try to duplicate what goes on in a traditional lab setting. We should create things you can't do in a traditional lab setting because that's a magnet for smart mm. people. Then the smart people work together, then they mm. attract more smart people, mm. And, and, and mm. it's that. So, I mean, mm. unless you're able to get that whole flywheel going, it's hard to start these. But there are communities like here in the UK and, yeah. and elsewhere where, where you certainly well can do that. And yeah. I, think, I think that's been the heart of the road. Yeah. You know, I, I was at DeepMind yesterday. And I, I have a tremendous respect for Demis and DeepMind because I think they too have a clarity of vision. I always thought the Broad needed clarity of vision and had clarity of vision. And they've had a clarity of vision that they've held on to for quite a long time, yeah. and it's been a great roadmap. And the people are there not just to make money, they're there because they're gonna change the world but be, be heroes at the same time. So mm. I don't think the, these lessons about building the kinds of transformative organizations are just in academia or, mm. or industry. Mm. The other thing I found neat about the Broad is it took almost like an industrial it almost industrialized scientific discovery. Sure. Like when you walk in there, it doesn't feel like an institute. Like you can be walking into like some epic like pharmaceutical company that like through say through software and data and like lab automation and built software internally, as we heard from. Uh, as well as having lots of individual ago. work going on. Yeah, yeah. So the key things were, we were not afraid of scale. Yeah. I think biology had a certain sense of oh scale bad. Yeah. I think we had a sense that. Every problem needed to be answered at the right scale for that problem. Yeah. And playing footsie with a problem that required a large scale was pointless. Mm. Just, just bite the bullet and take it on. And then right. do, and so know what those levels are to, to take it on. And then you, you have to respect people who bring those skills. So the Broad has you know, standard academic labs and things. We also have things we call platforms. Yeah. We never call them core facilities. Yeah, we have which, them here. Yeah, because a core facility is like your dry cleaner. Yeah. You drop off your clothes you at nine, you pick it up at five, and it's, you wouldn't say you collaborate with your dry cleaner. Whereas you really collaborate with these platforms because they make you super powerful. Mm. And so that mutual respect, and, 
And the platforms have standard operating procedures and they know their costs and mm -hmm. all these other things. And you don't want a graduate student running the same experiment every day mm -hmm. because they will not be able to reproduce what they did. So again, it's multiple cultures that, that are needed mm -hmm. and being willing to just stare a problem in the face and say, this is gonna be needed for this problem. We care about this problem, therefore we will learn how to do that. Yeah, yeah. Maybe like again, drawing in the analogy a bit into what's happening in AI uh, at the moment. You know, there's there's um, you know some some people who believe we should be setting up almost government labs to do AI, um, and others who believe you know we can do them in big tech companies, and others who believe again, for a third option that we can do it in the open source. And I was just curious, like in the topic of the broad, like do you think you could have achieved what you did if it were a government lab? Not in the U.S. The U.S. doesn't have a mechanism to create those. Okay. Um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, nothing against the idea of government labs, and they can be powerful for certain purposes. Yeah. But the U.S. has this kind of remarkable model of funding of science, where universities are the performers. Right. Um, it was created right after World War II by this guy, Vannevar Bush, who was the the architect of this, and the U.S. funds the infrastructure of a university in in parallel to the direct cost of the grant. So if I want to increase the research base of MIT, I can keep hiring people as long as they can keep getting the grants because the government will provide me the infrastructure. Okay. Many countries say, we're going to give you this fixed amount of building, and then you're out of building. This weird little financial mechanism that, that says, we will give you matching infrastructure for whatever you actually get based on quality of grant has allowed successful places to grow and so it's been a secret of the U.S. And I, I look at many other countries and say, I wonder why you don't adopt mm. that. It's a really mm. good idea. Mm. Um, it's all about sharing secrets here. So, so, so you know, the, well, this is a secret. Next, you'll report next year that somebody <laughs> has gone and changed their country to do this. Um, but government labs get set up rarely, and they're not the engine of innovation. The big issue for the Broad was creating a place that brought together Harvard, MIT, mm. and five teaching hospitals where any faculty at any of those could be part of the Broad. Mm. You can imagine how simple that was. Um, re reaching an inst interinstitutional kind of understanding that this was going to be a free trade zone across it and setting rules. Mm. And it's now been 20 odd years. And there was originally a 100 page document that was written to define all this. And the success metric is we never read the document. <laughs> because the document was based on common sense principles. And we tried to anticipate what were all the ways people could game the system and write rules that really couldn't easily be gamed. And so it sort of worked. And I do think the power of having an MIT culture and a Harvard culture and a hospital culture mm. has been a secret for it. And it also means that we collect the most ambitious young people from across the whole ecosystem yeah. rather than hiring people and we retain them forever. Yeah. So there were a lot of hacks in creating this thing, yeah. which means the Broad is not a perfect example for, it should not be copied molecule for molecule mm. in other places. The goal is figure out the solution that works for your amazing ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And did you just get lucky with, with uh, developing and designing some of the most impactful things like out there in biology, like CRISPR, or was this like, in, was this like an intention to get people together with the view of leading to technologies which could be relevant and potentially commercial? Or? Well, technologies and information and yeah. applications. Yeah. No, it was, it was very intentional. I mean, I think there was a certain sense that, I mean, I even wrote about this, and it's always funny to go back and read your own writing from yeah, long ago. You cringe about some of the things. But, but in the ninth, around 1996, I wrote some paper about the new genomics at a time that genomics was just, let's get all the letters of the human genome, um, it was talking about how we were gonna need all the variation in the human population. We were gonna need to read out the RNA from every cell type. We were gonna need to have a tool that would be able to manipulate genes. It was CRISPR without having the words CRISPR. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we had to do this in cancer. And we, we actually collected a bunch of people who believed in this grand hallucination. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we've taken it. So the idea that we had a place where Aviv Regev came and developed so much of the single cell biology, the ability to read out these single cells, it, she's brilliant, she did an amazing job, and it was a place 
at which those kinds of dreams were part of the mm. whole advancing path that, that was going on. Um, and that was why, the, you know, I think Demis at DeepMind, I, I feel I have enormous respect for, because he too had yeah. this sense of, he knew where they were going. Yeah. I think the Broad's greatest benefit was many universities are hiring lots of smart people to cover their courses, but you couldn't say if you were a university president, Harvard is devoted to solving X, because it can't be. Yeah. But the Broad actually had a point of view of what it was devoted to solving and tried to find people to solve it and platforms to enable yeah. it, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's really inspiring. And I mean, I, I, like talking to you just like brings me back to spending a few years in that. In you can come back over anytime. Yeah, offer me a sabbatical, I'll take it. Yeah, OK. Um, We're on the record <laughs> for that purpose. The rest of it will do off the record. But I'm happy to have you come over. Yeah. Sweet. Great. Mission accomplished. Um, but you have this conference to run and this Air Street Capital. So I know he's not actually going to take me up on it. Anyway, carry on. Yes. Next step is uh, yeah, AI and biology. So yes. you know, we've I'm in favor. Yeah, I think we're in a pretty <laughs> Okay, great. So we got eight minutes left for questions. <laughs> um, no, 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 I mean it's no, I mean it sounds like uh, I mean to me this is probably one of the most exciting, impactful, like fruitful areas that one could spend one's machine learning skills in and biology skills in, so I'd be interested in, I mean, we can take this anywhere, but if there's some, you know, a couple of things that are top of your mind when you think about that and discuss it with Demis and other Yeah, materials. yeah, yeah. So, look, it is the most satisfying because, of course, if you want to tell your kids what did you do and you said, in the end, we figured out how to save lives, that's a nice yeah. thing to tell your kids. It's also one of the hardest things to do. Um, I am in awe of the progress in AI, and I mean that not in some you know, light way, I mean that in a serious, deep way as somebody who's a mathematician at yeah. heart. Um, but you have to ask, how is biology a little different? So take the example where it's been unbelievably successful, protein folding. So protein folding is a really well-defined problem mm -hmm. where we have a massive amount of data because nature keeps generating proteins and you can throw them in and learn from them. And what you're trying to do, the output is really clear. It's mm. the position of atoms. Yeah. So chemistry, I believe, is a great application. Yeah. The really biggest challenge right now is like cell biology. Our ability to collect the kinds of information we want about cells is only just now ramping up. We don't have all the data we need about what's, how cells respond and what they do. And there are early efforts to say, oh, let me figure out which drug will cure diabetes. But honest to God, yeah. we need both amazingly more data and new models. So if you ask me, let's go back to that. There's the sequence of the genome. There's all the variants in the yeah. genome. There's the genes expression pattern in tissues. You know, I work my way up and I've got all the cell types and all that. What is the next thing that's needed? Yeah. The programs of biology, the programs of the human cell. Just like the genome was once thought to be infinite and now is on your you know, iPhone, mm -hmm. there's a finite number of programs that run in cells. I don't know what the number is. Is it 72,000 or something? But there's a finite number of programs. At some sense, they are the functional expression of all of biology. They are the functional latent space in which we want to describe any cell type, any infection, any state. The thing for biology over the next five-ish, 10 years max, is to be able to take tissue in any setting, a sample, a cancer, yeah. and say, I'm gonna be able to recognize the 47, protein, 47 programs that are running in it right now and give me guidance as to where to intervene to do something. That sounds about as crazy mm. as getting the genome or getting all the cell types, mm. but I don't think it is. I think, in fact, as I'm looking at some of the work in large language models mm. now being applied to gene expression, yeah. I mean, you think about the attentional mechanisms that are built into that, you could ask, hmm, I wonder if those attentional mechanisms are really finding the programs for me, or maybe some other thing is finding the program. Yeah. There is a great conversation to be had between AI and biology, but you can't scrape the web because we don't have all the data we need, so it'll have to be a conversation that says, and what kind of more data do we need? Yep. How will we make it cheap enough to, to, to yep. you know, gather and back and forth? But it's incredibly important, but like what we said at the top of the conversation, you have to go in with a deep respect for 
the nature of problems, mm. the taste about problems, what's good. Because I think large language models do a great job in language, and mm. they've shown us how utterly generic they can be. Mm. But I think we've thought hard about natural language processing for a very long mm. time. I think biology has different sets of principles. Yeah. And as long as we're open to learning both of those simultaneously, yeah. then I think there's a, a tremendous amount of progress to be made. Yeah. yeah I mean, there's a discussion with uh, Michael Bronstein and a few other speakers around uh, like the importance of priors in, in machine learning. And I mean, biology is one of the, and chemistry is one of those domains where we do have a lot of them. Like we do have models of how certain systems work and, and data sets and et cetera that it feels like we shouldn't just expect models to just learn them from scratch from text. That seems a bit... That's right. And, and you should, I mean, you talk about CRISPR. Yeah. CRISPR is the ability to knock out lots of genes. Yeah. If I knock out all the genes simultaneously, yeah. that is in different cells, and read them out as, as the gene expression, that's a method called perturb seek, parallel knocking out and reading of that. Suppose we have perturb seek data on hundreds of cell types, thousands of cell types. Now we're not just getting mm. descriptive data, but we're building in perturbational data. Mm. And our models can be learning that. Well, clearly the LLM should be incorporating that and learning that, or maybe it's not an LLM. I'm, LLMs are probably not the last possible yeah. you know, clever idea. So again, I want to push biology to say, you need to generate massive amounts of data to really get us what we want. We've got pictures there in the brain yeah. of in situ data. Yeah. We want to be able to generate gene expression yeah. with, with in situ sequencing and in situ probes across many, many, many people. I, I think this should be an inspiration to biology to f even Bob Weinberg should say, yeah, these data-driven approaches, maybe they are useful for something. Yeah. And, and therefore, we ought to think about all the different ways we're going to get the data going forward. Yeah. It won't be as fast to, to cure all disease and do things as, as many of these applications we're hearing about, but it, it will be something you'll want to tell your kids you did. Yeah, but even in that 10-year arc that I was involved in, it, I mean, I remember reading your papers around bulk microRNA. Yeah. Uh, sorry, microarray. Uh, yeah, exactly. Arrays for gene expression. Now you can do what you were discussing: single cell within a specific place in a tissue in 3D. Like this is nuts. Right, it's a revolution. Every like three or four or yeah. five years, and it's an amazing field for that. Yeah. So almost anything. I mean, I remember when we were doing the first genetic map of the human genome, which was 1987. It had 403 genetic markers, and oh my God, you were exhausted working yeah. with, you know, Helen Donis Cowan group when, when that got done. And then, of course, today, every genetic variant, if I, if I take you and I sequence you, yeah. and I look at all the genetic variants that you have that differ from the reference sequence, 99.99% are in the public databases yeah. already. So we have all of that. Yeah. But I know, because I was there at each of the stages, that as optimistic as I am, I always underestimated how rapidly it would move. Yeah. And it's gone so much further than I could have imagined. Yeah. So the only rule I have is I should imagine what's coming and then multiply it by some significant yeah, factor. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like trust the exponential. Yeah, trust, it's, exactly. It's trust the exponential. Yeah. Because yeah. it's autocatalytic. Everything you invent becomes a tool for, yeah. for doing new things. And I think none of us are great at projecting the exponentials. Yeah. But biology and, and machine learning are the two things that most have those exponentials. Yeah, fantastic.